So we are great to have you know uh, Dr. Min Chen here. Dr. Min Chen is an assistant professor at the Department of uh, Forest and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, before he started, he spent four years four years as a uh, research scientist at the Giant Global Change Research Institute uh, in the Pacific, Pacific Northwest National Lab. He obtained his bachelor's and master's degree in computer science and remote sensing uh, from Beijing Normal University in China and his PhD in the Earth and Atmospheric Sciences from Purdue University in 2013. Uh, and then he spent three years doing a postdoc at Harvard University and Carnegie Institute of for Science at Stanford. His interests are in earth system modeling, remote sensing of vegetation, and integrated analysis of human earth system dynamics. Thanks for joining us, Min, and you can start whenever. Oh, I also have to tell people um, this uh, video is being recorded and uh, we're going to put it on YouTube later for people who can't join to kind of uh, visit the events. Cool. Yeah. All right, thanks a bit and thank you for your invitation. And I'm very happy and be honored to give this, uh, I, I would say, not talk or something. I just uh, want to take, at, uh, take it as an opportunity to, to communicate with you to share about some of my thoughts on academic job search. Uh, probably I'm, I, I'm uh, certainly I'm not an expert on, in this aspect, but I have some uh, probably, I would say probably unique uh, experience in academia. Uh, so I have uh, probably have some uh, insights that could be a little bit different from the others. So, yeah, I, I will just in this uh, in this slide, I will just uh, briefly go over my thoughts, my insights on this uh, different positions in academia or related to research. And I think uh, we will have a lot of time just uh, uh, for discussion. Uh, I, I probably I'll just allocate more time on that on that part. Uh, uh, Sabit has uh, already introduced uh, my background. I, I got my bachelor's and master's degree from Beijing Normal University in China, uh, majoring in computer science and remote sensing respectively. And I got P my PhD from Purdue, but majoring in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. Then I moved to Harvard to study ecology, which uh, is the application of my PhD study. and. Uh, uh, global ecology at Carnegie Institution for Science at Stanford. Then I actually I started with my fact like a tenure track faculty position search and got a few a couple of uh, on site interviews, but finally failed. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, but there's opportunity uh, opening at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I think it's good a reputation of the National Laboratory, so I got went to interview and got a staff scientist position there. Then I worked four years there. Uh, I start looking for other opportunities again. And then I just uh, right a month ago, I started my new job as an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, yeah, this is uh, just a regular warning <laughs> before applying for academic jobs. You probably have should have a good understanding the difference between academia and the industry and the life could be totally different. I listed the difference in five dimensions, the freedom, opportunities, salary, impacts, and job security. This, uh, the red means uh, better, but not necessary, just uh, in general speaking. So academia, as you know, have a lot of freedom. You can explore on your own idea and do your own research. But for industry, you probably work on some projects or some uh, uh, company-oriented uh, tasks. You probably have to report to your manager on your work progress. So you have less freedom. Opportunity, uh, I would say opportunities, that's kind of, I mean, career growth. So once you get in academia, it's the career path is already almost like it's sort of set there. So you can imagine what's your next 10 year or next five year looks like. But the industry, there's a lot of different opportunities. You probably just got a good idea. You, get, you start up your own company or you have some, some of your colleagues left, you got promoted to a new position very quickly. And salary, that's very obvious. 
academia's salary is much lower than industry, uh, uh, in, than those who, uh, who earn in, in, in industry. The figure on the right side shows is a, a result from an NSF survey. From that, you can see in every discipline of uh, uh, science and technology domain, the uh, salary in academia is much lower than those in industry. For example, I have been living in the San, Fran San Francisco Bay Area for a long while, but I, <laughs> yeah. So I, as a postdoc, I only earn like sixty thousand dollars per year, but my neighborhoods who work in high tech companies they easily earn like one hundred fifty k or two hundred k or even more than that. And impact, of course, academia. You are exploring the edge of uh, the the human's knowledge. So you are making huge impacts on the human society. Industry, yes, you are, for example, you're working on, on Apple, uh, you are making iPhones, a lot of people are using iPhones, so you're also making impacts. So the impacts are different, depends on what you think about it. But as a researcher, I think most people probably just think, okay, producing new knowledge is kind of a good stuff. You have better impact. And for job security, this is also in general. Uh, academia usually have a good, better job security. You are, once you're hired as a postdoc, you usually have a three year funding support or two years funding support. Once you're hired as tenure track faculty or some other uh, like scientist position, this is something like a permanent, permanent job station. And Unless there's uh, no projects coming, you you are unlikely to lo lose your job. But the industry, yeah, you can read lots of news because of the uh, stock uh, stock market, because of the, uh, the the macro economy of the whole world. It's very likely, uh, not very likely. Things always happen that people buy. I will assume that you're interested in jobs after reading the uh, 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 the slides I just show. Um, here I listed some typical academic career passes for starting from PhD student. So if you decide to go industry, you probably can directly go there. But if you're going in our research discipline race, very likely you sh you need to do a postdoc before applying for a permanent. Uh, uh, position. Uh, at least two kinds of postdoc. It's a postdoc in academia, which usually like um, research institutions or research universities. And there's also a big population of postdoc in government-owned uh, labs, like DOE national labs or NASA labs. Um, yeah, and EPA labs, a lot of things. And from that, you, all, you could also have very dis, uh, di, uh, different career paths. For academia postdoc, you, you're likely promoted to be a academic staff in the same university or research faculty position in the same university. But you're also, if you're doing well, you, pro, you can apply for a tenure track faculty position as well. Uh, but we can see that, uh, yeah, the thickness of, of this arrow shows the so probability. Most oh, sorry, um, and the government lab postdocs they have a big opportunity to be promoted to staff scientists working in those uh, government labs because the those government labs are usually project based. Once you're familiar with those projects, you have more opportunities than people outside of this uh, government laboratory. I also want to emphasize that uh, we can see a lot of. Uh, 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 turnover in your colleagues, they can jump between these uh, different job categories. We see lots of uh, academic staff and research faculty jump into tenure track faculty or go to government owned labs as staff scientists. Uh, yeah, we also see some uh, this exchange between tenure track faculty and staff scientists, but it's uh, rarely see uh, this tenure track faculty goes to research faculty or academic staff. 
Yes, yeah, the next few slides, I think I'm going to give some brief introduction about this, uh, uh, some pros and cons or some uh, uh, general idea about what the, the position looks like. So basically postdoc is uh, limited term employees for these uh, uh, university research institution or uh, government labs. There are actually three uh, categories of postdocs. So for example, the first one is uh, post, there are uh, quite a few postdoc fellowships are open for application. That's from like NASA has a, a, a postdoctoral, uh, NASA postdoctoral program, MPP. NOAA also has its uh, postdoc fellowship in NSF. And also some uh, quite quite a few pre prestigious uh, universities also have this own uh, fel uh, postdoc fellowship, like as I know Harvard, Princeton, Berkeley, and also National Labs has some postdoc fellowship uh, available as well. They called super postdoc. <laughs> so yeah, it's a good thing that if you got this fellowship, it's um, you will be treated. It's a kind of honor. It's, um, and you have the uh, flexibility to whatever you want to do. And you usually get higher pay. As I know, at National Labs, the super postdoc can earn more than the permanent, permanent employees. And you also have a good uh, chance to work with outstanding mentors. You usually, yeah, once you got those fellowships, you, you usually can choose what, which one you would like to work, uh, work with. Yeah, to if you want to apply for those fellowships, you definitely need to have some creative ideas to track those fellowships. So people, there's a it's a high selective process. So you have to be outstanding in terms of your CV and your uh, yeah. I think, but I think the most important thing is your ideas. But certainly, your CV has to have to be able to support your ideas. And the second category is, uh, uh, is due to the specific project things. That's the most common cases for, uh, for the postdoc position. Uh, the good thing that those projects are usually clearly defined because it's originated from a successful uh, research proposal uh, developed by PI. And so once those has been well defined, you probably could be more productive, productive, just do it, right? So yeah, the secret to get this position is just to fit the project needs. What, the, what kind of skills the project needs and what kind of people they're looking for. If you fit, you, are, yeah, you have a good chance to get that position. And there are also some other point, uh, postdoc opportunities. It's not specific, uh, specific projects oriented or post fellowship. So it's just uh, some, uh, for example, some uh, uh, some professors or some new PI, some PIs, especially new PIs, they are trying to explore different research directions. They are interested in collaborating with creative people to develop new proposals. And they would like to offer like one year salary to you and develop a proposal with you and yeah, and to write proposals. And then you, this, this proposals can provide some support for this postdoc for another two or three years. Yeah, the key thing is that if you have good idea and you, you have a good chat with the PI, then it's, uh, then it's this kind of uh, uh, postdoc position is also uh, possible. And yeah, as postdoc usually don't have PIs because it's a limited term. Uh, if you want, it's, but you still can write research proposals, but that's uh, you have probably to be the co-investigator, but then your mentor will be the principal investigator. For this kind of position, pressures usually from your progress, uh, project progress, and you might worry about uh, how to land a permanent job in the net for the next step. And there's also some other types like academic stuff. 
a typical title is like project assistant associate or full scientist or similar like researcher. It's usually affiliated with a department, research center, or institute, or uh, just a research group. The good thing for academic staff is they can usually they can ask for PI status, or they can some some place. It just differ, differs from place to uh, places. Mm, some places it's just directly you have the PI status. Um, some cons is that uh, cons are that. The academic stuff is usually soft money because uh, that means that pro uh, that's the project based. Once the project has terminated, you probably have facing some challenge of continuing your uh, position in this institution. And salaries could vary largely. I, I see scientists who only own who only only earn like sixty thousand or fifty thousand dollars per year, and I also see very senior scientists or staff earn even like two hundred, uh, two hundred k per year. And freedom is uh, freedom level. I, I mean, the research of freedom is low to medium because uh, you have a, a project uh, to work on on that. And pressure from self-funding support, landing a permanent job, project uh, progress, and probably you have if you own your um, own project, you also have some pressure on uh, project management. And then the research faculty is also employed uh, permanent employee. Typical titles you can see the research assistant professor, research associate professor, research professor like that. Uh, similar to to a. Uh, uh, Assistant science, just the academic staff is uh, also affiliated, could affiliate with department or any uh, unit in an uh, uh, institution. But it's uh, usually treated as a faculty member. So some departments may get them involved into the uh, faculty meeting and uh, yeah, and uh, get involved in the, some decision processes. And it's a good thing for research faculty if you don't like teaching. So it's typically no teaching load. You can 100% focus on your research. And you can also run, or you, you run or you, uh, your own lab. So that means you can use your project uh, funding to recruit your stu uh, recruit students or postdocs to work with you. And they or yeah, so they, they hold PI status. Uh, but the same similar thing that they are soft money based, don't have a, uh, uh, you have to get continuous to get the projects comes in to support yourself and your group and freedom level I would say medium to high because your own your own lab you de you develop the proposal you you decide which which research you want to do and the pressure is from self group financial support and of course the project progress and the management and then the tenure track faculty, I believe for you, yeah, the lots of uh, this kind of people in all, uh, the universities all, all across the United States. You have seen a lot of them. And typical titles, just assistant associate and full professor. And so you run your own, own lab and you have the PS status, you have to teach, research and do services. This, uh, some universities have very clear definition of what fraction you have to do on teaching or research on services. Some universities don't have such a clear definition. And that also depends on your, uh, uh, what type of uh, uh, university you're working in. Uh, if uh, research oriented, research university typically emphasize on research and there's you know, lots of good, really good teaching colleges or teaching universities. Mm. They, they expect the tenure track faculty to spend most of the same time, their time on teaching. The good thing for tenure track faculty is uh, the university provides, not, usually provides nine month salary. That means your base salary is guaranteed, uh, especially if, if you got tenured. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, <laughs> here you have 12 months, you have to, uh, if you want to earn money in the three months, you have to raise project or 
seek collaboration with the industry or somewhere else to, to earn the stream of salary. But you have freedom to, to do that. That's why I say freedom level is very, very high. Basically, just do whatever you want to do. And, but of course, you have, if you got project from the funding agencies, you have to work with the, the project as well. But those projects are usually defined by yourself. So pressure is usually for tenure. It's, uh, I, I, I bet you know about the tenure system in the United States. Basically, you have to do excellent job in, in the three aspects, teaching, research, and services. And they will grant you tenure after five, uh, five or six year uh, 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 so-called tenure track period, usually as assistant professor. And then you got, when you got tenured, you are, yeah, you're more secured. And you can also expect pressure from teaching and mentoring your students. You, you can imagine lots of headaches there. <laughs> and of course, uh, got uh, financial security from, for running your lab and support your summer salary and the work progress and management of your, your own work and your, your lab and interact with uh, the other colleagues. Yeah, I, I think one of my unique uh, experience that I worked with uh, PNL for four years. So I know a little bit about the staff, staff scientists in DOE's national labs. That's something probably not every people knows, knows about it. I would say the process of this uh, kind of position is uh, the unique and powerful resources uh, in national labs because DOE uh, usually has uh, has invested a lot of uh, resources uh, on developing the world-leading uh, scientific facilities. In, in my field, I, I use a supercomputer a lot. So you probably know the Summit uh, supercomputer that has been uh, 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 launched in the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And at PNL, if we do, if you are atmospheric scientist, we have uh, we run the uh, atmospheric research measurement facility that includes uh, not, uh, quite a few airplanes and ground measurement stations. And this still you also support like set up the global network of uh, network observation observational networks, and they also have uh, like. Uh, Chemical molecular laboratories. Uh, that's just also world leading facilities. So if, if you are an uh, employee of uh, the national labs, you have directly have the access to those uh, uh, great facilities. And you then you are also working usually working on large projects. With large projects, that means the DOE funded. That's uh, they envision those kind of projects and lead to the science development in the next decade or, or even a few decades. So you're working with uh, great colleagues there. You know a lot of um, very uh, talented scientists and just uh, working on, on those large projects to uh, explore the knowledge, new knowledges. And another good thing I feel is a good administrative support. So those people are, yeah, they are, uh, they receive good training, uh, good training, they got paid uh, by your projects, so the projects you're working on, and they're usually very responsive to your administrative support. So, so I, I have a comparison from my current position and the national, when I was at the PNL, I can tell the, the, the difference. They usually respond to your emails very quickly. And the cons, I think the first one is just soft money. Usually these uh, staff scientists, also it's a permanent position, it's soft money. It's totally project-based. So every working hour you have to charge to a project. Uh, so yeah, people sometimes worry about the uh, job security there. But it's a good thing that it's usually not the case. Usually, because there's the large projects from DOE usually funds you for three years or five years or even longer. So 
you have just job security for long term. And another con is probably the location. But I know some uh, national labs have very good location. For example, Lawrence Berkeley, Lawrence Livermore, Brookhaven, or Argonne. But some other national labs like Los Alamos, PNL, and Oak Ridge, they're not located in big cities. So that's probably somebody. Maybe a lot of people like that, but I know somebody don't just don't like the location. It could be some uh, concern for somebody. The last one I would say is less impact. Because um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, I think that's an inter interesting phenomena. The national lab labs staff scientists usually don't give um, have less interaction with academia, so they're typically less known by the uh, uh, by the scientific community. Uh, that's, that's that's something interesting to discuss. I, I don't I don't know exactly why, but I I, I have uh, I've seen this phenomenon. And the culture in uh, in national labs, they usually emphasize teamwork. That's the most emphasized thing. That means you're not your own. You have to work with other people. If you like individual uh, working, probably national lab is not a good place for you. And yeah, pressures from self financial support. You probably worry about, oh, I don't have projects cover them. But national is a good thing. You have to talk, you can talk to managers, they usually can help with it, help you with that. And also pressure from project progress and management. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the next couple of slides, I just want to talk quickly, go over the interviewing process for postdoc and ten track. Uh, uh, Faculty positions. So postdocs, you usually have uh, at least one interview. That's uh, tel uh, either tele uh, through a telephone or a tel uh, teleconference, or just you can direct go there for in person interview. Assume that you are doing a tele uh, teleconference interview. You have certainly there's three type of things you have to get prepared. The first is a self introduction. Uh, it's a good thing that if you can use uh, a few sentences to summarize your research, your past research, your research uh, interests, that would be great. And you will receive questions regarding to your motivation, work style, and skill. Those are the most common uh, questions you will receive. And of course, there are some others. And you usually will have uh, like a, at least a few minutes to ask your own question to the um, uh, to the people who interviewed you. It's just quite, yeah, you, you can ask whatever you like about the project, about the life, or about the working environment, everything you want. And sometimes if you could get, uh, have a good impression during the, uh, to the uh, uh, PI, uh, they probably just directly give you the offer. That's, that's great, but sometimes, they would like to wear cautious. They would like to in, invite you to go uh, to have an on-campus interview, uh, or to just want to meet you on a uh, professional conference in all field. Pro, for example, IEEE or or the AGU for meeting. Um, if you get invited to to the lab or on campus, you very likely will have you will. Ask to uh, to get uh, to give a seminar talk about your research, and you will meet the lab members and probably some other collaborative factors. Then, I if you got offer, if they would like to offer you a position, you will you will have opportunity to negotiate uh, to do some negotiation on your salary, on your starting date, on the length of your position. And probably, and relocation cost is very real for academia, but it's quite common for the national laboratories or, or other uh, government labs. And probably want to talk with the visa issue with the PI, especially. I, I can see lots of international scholars here. And if you are interested in the faculty position, um, it's a little bit more complicated than postdoc, but generally it's quite similar. 
the materials you have prepared is more than uh, postdoc, more than postdoc. For postdoc, it's usually just a CV or a research statement. But for faculty position, you have to prepare a CV, your uh, a well written cover letter, your research statement, your teaching statement. And nowadays, uh, lots of universities are asking for like statement of diversities and integrations. And you also need to collect refer, uh, reference letters, either providing their names or just collect the letters by yourself. That's different from institution to institution. And some institutions also ask for like three or two representative writing samples from you. It could be your paper, your white papers, or just some um, uh, technical reports, everything that you think that can you represent yourself. And there, there's usually a, tech, a teleconference interview with search committee. That's a group of people in the department or across the campus. The same thing, you have to do a self-introduction and questions usually ask your motivation, why you're you are interested in this position and what's your teaching style, what's your research, what's your working style, how do you mentor, uh, mentor your students and postdocs and some other experience like uh, funding uh, proposal writing or like uh, services on, on for professional societies, for example. And of course you will have your uh, opportunity to ask your own questions. And here is a big, the most, uh, uh, the biggest difference from the postdoc interview this is usually a must, it's an in-person interview. You know, in the current, <laughs> to 2020, due to the pandemic, lots of the in-person interview have moved to Zoom. Uh, but let's assume it's next year, everything will go back to normal. You will go, be invited to the uh, campus visit for usually for two days. And you're expected to give a research seminar. Uh, that's, uh, that's a minimum. Some university may ask you to give a teaching seminar. You just assume that you are an instructor of a course. You give a sample lecture to the search committee or some students. And sometimes they ask for your chalk talk to demonstrate your research ideas, what you are going to, which funding agency you are going to write, uh, seek financial support. How do you mentor your postdoc and graduate students? Uh, something like that. And you are you you uh, you would expect to meet a number of professors across the uh, uh, the campus. They are the people who are interested in you, and you can also request a meeting with some others who are not on the on your schedule. Um, and you will have a meeting with uh, students, graduate students, and the early career scientists. They usually expected to expected you to give there some uh, uh, insights or some uh, suggestions on their on their career uh, uh, career growth. And last thing you will have lunches and dinners with the search committee. <laughs> that's some that's some it's a it's a opportunity for the search committee to uh, to have sense how how you what what's the feeling to work with you <laughs> looks like is is this a good good person to chat or is this is this people easy going is uh it's anyways is it a good good colleague they, they basically it's kind of marriage they just want to find the right people to work with in their department and after interview you usually want to write uh, some follow-up emails and finally go to the negotiation step uh, you will negotiate salary, your startup package. That's uh, something like you you to start start up your research, set up your labs, recruiting people, and about your tight academic title. You do you want is assistant professor title is good enough, or you want just associate professor or full professor? You also negotiate office space, and some people who has who is married and has a two body problem. You can talk about spouse hire. And also teaching load, how much, how much courses you want, how many courses you are going to teach in the first semester or 
you want to get it waived in the first semester or first year. Um, yeah, I, I have been thinking about what kind of secrets I can give you about success. I, here is uh, just a few bullets I can think about. I think the most important is about fit. No matter it's postdoc or faculty position, the most important is fit. For postdoc, it's project based, and for faculty position, because the department, uh, the department usually needs somebody to teach some course, or they are interested to, they are interested in uh, exploring new research directions, or there's some just someone recently retired some uh, yeah old professors just recently retired so there is a gap in that research direction to want to get new people new blood company so if you fit that's what you are well i mean you probably have succeeded like at least 70 percent then you yeah get very prepared for the interviews you you should yeah if a good strong cv with publications good publications projects experience, you have some proposal writing experience, and if you get some proposals get funded, that's great. And if you have a strong re recommendation letters from the, uh, uh, well, I would say some big guys in this field, that's really fantastic. And demonstrate yourself as a big colleague, uh, as a good colleague. Yeah, just like I just said, this kind, just kind of marriage similar um yeah i think i already talked over 30 minutes um and thank you for your attention i would like to take question i would discussion i think it's probably i i just get a very brief overview about uh on the processes i think more details we can uh uh can be can, can be figured out during our discussions and at the same time, I'm also looking for a postdoc, working on remote sensing of soil and use fluorescence and vegetation radiation transfer modeling. Uh, if you're interested, uh, yeah, you can find my uh, contact information there. Thank you. Sub it. Oh, thanks so much. That was uh, that was very good. Uh, I, I like the kind of um, informal nature. Uh, I think like we last week we had a presentation by JPL and I think it was good but it was very formal but I, I kind of like the fact that you know you kind of answered a lot of questions already so um, there is a uh, there's a few questions I'm going to start asking them I would say like if you have any follow-ups just unmute yourself and um, you know we can like talk uh, you know, pretty much like real time so I think the first question is uh, by Rabia and it it, it is like, you know, can you explain the difference between hard money and soft money uh, for those who are not familiar with the term? Yeah, the hard money or soft money means that, or soft money, I would say, soft money is usually just project based. Once you get your project, you have your salary. Once you don't have project support yourself, you will lose your salary. You probably have to take vacation you will be forced to take vacation like that. So the so hard money is something like the, uh, the institution promised you that you don't have to do anything. You will get money, you will get your salary. But your job is to seek new opportunities. So is hard money usually tied to teaching? Um, or, or is there kind of like, are there national labs which pay like, you know, hard money, for example? I, my experience that told me that I rarely see that in that national lab. Tight test teaching, usually yes. But I do see some for some institutions like Carnegie Institution for Science, that's a re private research, uh, uh, research institution. It's 12 months hard money. Because there's money from, from the endowment. Cool. So the next question is, uh, if I have a PhD from another country, is US postdoc research experience important for faculty job application in the US? Uh, I would say that we are plus, but I do see successful, uh, successful examples that who earned PhD from somewhere like from China, they got a faculty position in the US. I do see an example, 
but that's um, probably just one percent. I would say, if to be very honest. So, like, do you think that those people usually are like at world class institutions abroad that people in the faculty search committee know very well? Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, I I just want to say these are all my own personal opinion. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not an expert, just to share my own thoughts. Yeah, totally. I think that that's for everything. Uh, we, won't, we won't hold you uh, respond, legally responsible for what you do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want, don't want misleading, uh, to be misleading. Totally. Uh, by the way, if anyone has any follow-up questions to these, like, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and, and have a conversation. Uh, all right, so the next question is, Based on your experience, how long before obtaining a PhD is it reasonable to start applying for a postdoc? Um, well, that depends. For example, if I sometimes sometimes your advice, your PhD advisor have some good collaboration with some other place, for example. Uh, my PhD advisor have good collaboration with the MIT or some other like useful, uh, yeah, useful research institute. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of uh, our lab members, they just, uh, they have already started their collaborations with, uh, with the mentors of PIs in this institution during their group. So they directly go to uh, uh, those institutions for their first time. Yeah. Typically, uh, you uh, typically you will apply for a postdoc like uh, one year before your PhD, earning your PhD. You, you, you probably want to start exploring uh, uh, opportunities around from some uh, job posting website or some mailing list, and you usually will get your offer around, for example, if you, if you are expected to get your PhD around May, you probably land your postdoc offer like in January or February, something like that. Uh, cool, so like start a year earlier. Um, yeah, starting a year or so. Oh, and for postdoc fellowship, that's the one big category I mentioned. Pay attention to the deadlines. Mm -hmm. Get prepared for that. Uh, uh, you probably need to start writing your proposal for those fellowships at least uh, one, one or two months before the deadline. Uh, all right. So I think like what I'm hearing is start looking at least a year before you graduate, and then try to have it done by like you know four or five months before you graduate. Uh, so continuing with the above question, is it preferable to get a postdoc from the same institution as your PhD, or is it good to change the environment or maybe even your country? That's a good question. <laughs> in my opinion, it's good to change your environment to yeah. another institution. Basically, I, and I know a lot of people change their research directions. Uh, just remember, you are not expected to repeat your the same research as your PhD advisor. You are expected to create some new research directions when you are uh, establishing your own lab. So getting more uh, broaden your eyes, getting more experience will be much, very helpful. Uh, is there any average baseline uh, for postdoc salary that we should keep in mind? I'd say, <laughs> I'd say, that's a, yeah, that's a really region based. You can imagine Boston, Boston that, and some places in, for example, in UW Madison, this, the salary could be very different. But Boston and the institution by institution could be very different. Like Harvard and, well, it's, it's weird. Harvard usually provides less salary than some other institutions because uh, it's, it's prestigious, right? It's prestigious. Yes, yeah. yeah, it's just prestigious. You, 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 you earn the prestigious of your, your experience. So you, you have, yeah, it's successful for, for many people. I um, guess 
when when I was uh, looking for postdocs, this is a long time ago, it was like four years ago, and I clearly am not a postdoc. So maybe you know, like this was uh, just me. But I think like in in big cities, it tended to be a little bit higher salaries than smaller cities. And then Europe is completely different. In Europe, every kind of like country and region has standards, and every every institution has to at least hit those standards. So there is a minimum baseline that they have to offer postdocs. It's not like that in the U.S. In the U.S., it like varies extremely widely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All I talk about is about the U.S. <laughs> and I would say, if you want to give a number, I would say like fifty k per year is a reason reasonable uh, salary in our in our research field. All right, next question is from Forrest Williams. Uh, thank you for speaking to us today. Why did you personally choose to go to academia instead of industry? Oh, that's my dream, basically. I want to be a scientist. I don't want to work in industry as an engineer. It's quite simple. Yeah, I mean, like you saw the, the flow check and you know, what academic freedom. Uh, next question is by uh, Jedrez. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Anyway, it, it, it's. You mentioned spouse hire. Is it common for institutions to have your spouse find a job? Yes. Okay. That's a good benefit for uh, like especially universities uh, because the university itself, sometimes your spouse is also working in academia and is also qualified for a position in this university. If the university really wants you to fill their, their position, they will try to create a new position for you. Uh, for your for your spouse, and some universities have a specific funds available that has all allocated just for spouse hire. That means the department say, "Hey, this this people, I want hire hire him or her. Uh, he he or she is great." And but when we negotiate with him or her. They have an, uh, they have difficulty because of the two body problem. Can we apply for the uh, the spouse hire fund to support her spouse? Uh, to, to, to support the spouse. This, there is a process. There's a, but yeah, just remember if you get spouse hire into your negotiation, the negotiation process can be much longer than the normal process. It's quite common, I would say. Um, next question. So it's from Abhishek. Thank you for your talk. It was very informative. Is it possible to explore the industry for some time immediately after PhD and then move into an academic position in a university? It's possible. Um, and yeah, it's very possible. I, I saw this such kind of examples. And uh, as long as you keep your research going, it's no big gap. Um, yeah, is, if you get your publications going on every year, you have some publication re related research. I don't think that's a red flag, especially if you're working on like data science or like, you know, sensor driven, some data science, some industry experience could be a plus sometimes. And for engineering department, lots of people jumped from industry to academia. You can see a lot of those examples there. Yeah. I mean, like two examples at the top of my head are Kai Yu Guan from the University of Illinois uh, Champaign, who used to work at Climate Corporation after his PhD, before he started his job as professor. Uh, Hannah Perner at the University of Maryland, who used to work at Planet before her, um, after her PhD, before her yeah, so there's there's definitely examples, um, as as uh, Min said. Uh, the last question on this list, I think you already answered, but like you know, is it preferable to do a postdoc in the same field as your PhD, or maybe possible to go to a slightly different field? Well, that's uh, yeah, that's I just talked from my own personal preference, uh, but this is really different from people to people. It's really your choice. Uh, keep working on the same field will probably guarantee your more publications and your uh, more achievements in a short time period. But if you want to explore your uh, new ideas and uh, it's not, uh, well, if you're still working the same 
Well, I I would say still work in the same field, but could be a little bit different uh, research direction. Cool. So um, I'm going to ask a few questions. Please feel free to keep uh, posting questions on the chat, or you can unmute at any point and ask questions as well. Um, you know, uh, just whenever, whenever you, well, whatever you guys want. Um, so I guess like my question is, say you're a PhD student in your maybe second year, right, or third year. Um, you have decided that industry is not for you and you want to really kind of focus on getting a job in academia uh, or national labs. How do you kind of tailor the last two or three years of your PhD to put yourself in the best position to get a good postdoc and then get a um, you know, faculty, chance at a faculty? Good question. Um, I would say keep your research first, keep your research going, keep producing exciting results. And um, then try to attend professional meetings, such as IEEE or AGU meetings. And go to those meetings who uh, who uh, the people who are interested in will join in. For example, if you're interested in some people at MIT or Harvard and look at his or her CV or the lab website, which which meetings they they usually go to, go there, try to, try to meet with uh, the people, uh, introduce your, and those people, uh, those are good, uh, good opportunities to show their your, uh, show them your work and uh, yeah, good to get a good impression. Yeah, in my opinion, I, I yeah, I in, if I have two candidates, if there's one of the, both of them are quite uh, the same, both qualified and uh, quite similar um, background, I probably would like to recruit the one that I have met before. And then, yeah, and actually in the last couple of years, you probably have already read a lot of papers in your field or in the broad field, identify your interest, who, who you want to work with in the future. Um, as far as publications are concerned, everyone's you know worried about getting enough publications to start with and then enough citations on their publications and then getting publications in like key journals with high impact factors. So I think like this kind of thinking really like starts at your PhD level and then becomes much more prominent in your postdoc. How did you view publications as a PhD student and as a postdoc? And how do you think people should kind of, you know, like, like try to publish papers when you jump from PhD to postdoc? No publication. Um, the thing, uh, so just imagine you are the PI. You want to recruit one people. So you have uh, received a handful of CV. Mm -hmm. How do you judge which one is the right one? I think most people will see, okay, what's the background, academic background, your education background, the trajectory, what kind of research, uh, research you have done. And one important thing is uh, how many, what, uh, how many publications or what the quality of your publications are. Or is it, or it sometimes it doesn't have to be a number of publications, but if your publication, your research has some really interesting story or have good potential uh, for a new research direction, that will be fantastic. So publication is something that's a, it's a measurable, uh, uh, it's a it's a measurable indicator for for uh, for people's academic achievement. So so publication is important. You have to pay attention to that. But again, uh, but also in, uh, in the meanwhile, publication doesn't mean everything. <laughs> you have to pay attention to the quality of publication rather than your quantity of your publication. I would say one good publication is better than three. Just 
okay publications. That's that's very interesting. Um, cool. So uh, when you are kind of part of a faculty search committee, you get like hundreds of applications, right? And like most of those applications, you just like throw out immediately. Um, what are kind of like what do you think is helpful to put in your research statement, teaching statement, diversity statement? Uh, to kind of make you stand out to kind of a hiring committee? Is it kind of like saying that you have funded proposals already, or is it like really um, saying that there's a good fit between you and the university? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, that's a good question as well. So yeah, the first thing is definitely fit. Demonstrate the evidences that you are the right people for this position. That's, a, that's a, my research background, my research experience, and my research ideas are exactly matches what you need. And land, landing some uh, funded projects is a plus, but not necessary. And in research statements, you usually need to write a couple, at least a couple of research directions you want to do in the next five years. So if you have creative ideas and concrete implementation implementation plan, including where we can, uh, where I, I can uh, sort for funding, financial support, that means that uh, that gives the reviewers imp uh, impression that you are very prepared. There's low risk if they hire you, uh, that you you won't be uh, you you will not be successful. Uh, cool. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great answer. Thanks. I have another question on Slack now, which is, um, if you are at a national lab, how do you kind of uh, make sure you have something to say in your teaching statement, considering you might not have taught any classes? Yeah, that's a good question as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's challenging if you work as national laboratories. So, uh. But there's always opportunities. National labs usually have a partner university. For example, uh, Oak Ridge is partnered with uh, University of Tennessee. Argonne is partnered with University of Chicago. Brookhaven is partnered with Stony Brook, I think, or maybe I don't. Yeah, I don't quite remember. Uh, Kinell is partnered with University of Washington and Washington State. And I actually, I was working in a research institute of Kinell located in College Park, Maryland. So we are partnered with the University of Maryland. So yeah, and you can try to get joint appointment with those universities. Even, the, even the, if you don't get that, you can try to teach. That's very possible in those universities. And you can also mentor undergraduate or graduate students uh, in collaboration with, uh, with faculty members in the, in the universities. That will make your teaching experience uh, very strong. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think we are at time, but I'll ask uh, one last question and then, then we can kind of uh, stop. Um, you were a researcher at National Lab and you know you're going to do research in a university. What do you think is the biggest difference between the two kind of research experiences? I know you touched upon some parts of this earlier. Yeah. I think the biggest difference is the, uh, the freedom. So National Lab, you have to do whatever the project needs because it has to. Uh, at universities, you primarily are exploring your own ideas, yeah. what works and what doesn't work. But of course, uh, in, at National Lab, those projects are also scientific, uh, science-driven projects. So they also allow you to make mistakes. And that's OK, it's, it's, it's this way it doesn't work. So it also allows you that. But I mean, just relatively speaking. And yeah, and uh, in National Labs, you usually do some long-term projects. That's, for example, the projects I have been working in PNL that has been supported by DOE for 
over two decades. Okay. Two decades, yes. But in universities, it's unlikely to get that such long-term support. All right, well, thanks, Min. Um, that was great to talk to you. Hopefully we can keep doing it, like maybe every year. Next year, you come back and tell us like how your first year was as assistant. Yeah, maybe I have more experience. I'm sorry, everyone, it's just, uh, I'm fresh new assistant professor. No, I, I, it, was, it was interesting. I think like it's very interesting to have perspective of someone who's just kind of been through the whole, um, you know, because you had to share so much stuff about faculty dinners and lunches and stuff like that. And it's interesting for someone who's a PhD student who probably doesn't know what kind of the getting the job means. So I think it's very uh, useful. And I'm sure the video is going to be kind of useful to a lot of people. So uh, thanks. I'm going to stop recording now.